So we are done with our legal positivism and now we are dealing with our third major legal theory and that is natural law theory. Actually, this is uh, most philosophers would describe this as the opposite of legal positivism in such a way that this theory is trying to address the concerns or questions not addressed by the legal positivist and if you um, are wondering why there is that word natural in the name of the theory itself is because natural means reason or the law of reason or the requirements of reason so it's like an in if you're doing the natural law theory or you're using this theory you will be dealing as to the in-depth um, reason of the enactment of the law why it has been decided or um, passed by the members of congress or the legislators uh, and you have to focus on the why of the law not just the what the where and the who of the law so um, this uh, second theory is very important and it's very um, it remains to be the central way of understanding the law because especially if you notice the laws have um, their statement of policy and if you know the statement of the policy then you will know really the reason behind the enactment of the law now our third theory is Marxism and actually if you know that Marxism is basically or generally applied in economics but what I like um, in this theory is that it's a way of innovating economic concepts or understanding of economic institutions into the legal institution and one very um, crucial statement by a Marxist is that the law is an instrument of class oppression so still you have the element of classes in a society and it is the ruling class actually that dictates what the law should be and such that it has become an instrument of sustaining or perpetuating oppression of the um, lower class so you just have to be keen on um, on using this theory now we go to our fourth theory and that is realism but you have to detach realism from the usual political realism because what is the focus here in legal philosophy philosophy would be the American legal realism and I remember I reported this in my master's um, class and you have to uh, remember that the focus of um, American legal realism is as to the actuality of the legal processes and rules and the application and the focus basically is on our courts and I cited two um, well-known statements of these um, two realists um, Llewellyn uh, and Justice Holmes saying that um, it's if you if you look at it um, both statements mentioned about courts and you you should not be understanding realism in a more most objective um, way possible because actually realism does not discredit the non um, legal factors such as the social cultural and the psychological um, factors like the judges um, the biases and the prejudices of judges now this is very important because and um, in studying the law because it's more of telling us that actually there's beyond what the provision of the law you are studying while you are in law school and if you do the practice it's totally um, different or there are times that it's totally incongruous with what you learned in um, in law school so being a realist it's just like he, he, you are just very keen on what's actually happening and it could not be compliant with what the theory um, is telling us now there are I sh I'm sharing to you the three dimensions of law or legal reasoning and testing the validity or the the use of the law or 
you have to deal with these um, dimensions and one good example that I can say would be on um, the policy against bigamous marriage although um, in some jurisdiction or in um, in the south of the Philippines and or for the Muslim um, communities or society um, they uh, they allow um, polygamous marriages but it uh, for me it's really wrong to to label that although if you look at the Sharia rules then that's that is justified according and there are requirements actually actually and also it's not just a uh, uh, like um, it's just not like random something random because um, the the Muslim rules or the Islamic law has um, rules to uh, rules regarding that aspect now we go back now you have to address the legal reasoning these three dimensions because um, it would really affect as to how we use or who is who is affected of this law if the, the law is enacted like a bigamous um, in our civil courts bigamous marriage is not allowed so um, the application for that would be if you have a case and someone is filing uh, a case against a husband who remarried or uh, who's married twice despite the fact that she's he's married to another woman so the this these um, the legal theory for that is since there's a rule that the marriage or the family should not be attacked and that's a form of an attack for our mainstream society and if you if you look at it um, if there's a missing or a deficient aspect of the legal reasoning then the law could always be attacked and you have to take note the purpose of the law which is a way of um, uh, control or like putting rule and or peace and order in a society in a more coordinated manner because as we know that the law has been handed by um, the authority legitimate authority I have to emphasize legitimate on that aspect now I know as you go through these four theories the legal dimensions I would understand that you really have difficulty um, studying the subject especially if it's a requirement in your in the law school and in fact I taught I taught um, legal philosophy for like I think four times already in law school now I have quick study tips for you to um, ponder upon so that you will have um, not I'm not saying that it will be easy for you but I th you will have ideas how to make it easier for you now you just have to accept that the literature in the Philippines is not that rich why the explanation for that would be our society is not as advanced as that of the Western world or the Americas or um, Europe, the European Union. Now, you also have to accept that there's a difficulty of the vocabulary and let's say um, common philosophical words would be um, teleological or let's say um, transcendental and you have to have a dictionary in order to understand the jargons because it doesn't mean that um, these are purely legal matters we're tackling but it doesn't mean that there are vocabularies that are not purely um, philosophical and you also have to remember that the theories have different strands and meaning variants or strands because according to one theories it could be um, different from the other one but they also they, they still identify themselves like positivist or a realist or a marxist or a natural law theorist now they even overlap unknowingly you don't uh, unknowingly you uh, you don't notice actually when you do the reading but if you do an actual reading actually these these theories are interrelated they are talking the same thing it's just that of different lenses that's it now you have to transcend if you read you have to read by your imagination you have to detach yourself from the material and you have to think enrich yourself also and the way of enriching yourself is, a, is to explore the history, especially the biographies of legal philosophers. And if you know their biases and prejudices based on their um, um, works, like the, artic uh, the articles or essays or even the books that they've um, um, written, you will really have a wider and 
um, understanding and actually the, the irony is of this is that the more you study the more you will say that these series are interrelated no matter how difficult it may seem but it's it all boils down to the existence to the reason and purpose and application of the law and I just hope with this quick um, study tips and with the quick concepts about legal philosophy you learned something and I actually I don't expect you to love the subject it's just that you will find reason why the subject is taught in law school and there's always that reason and I'll see you next um, lesson and I hope you will apply this um, learnings that you have and you take care as we continue to face the pandemic have a nice day God bless you.